Hello everyone. My name is Konstantinos Tatsakis and I'm here together with my good uh, student and friend George Karadzas in order to present you uh, our work on fishing uh, with our, our work entitled Fishing with is uh, a hack recreation of an old uh, attack on more or less new mediums and with uh, more attack vectors. George. Hello, my name is George Karanzas. I am a student of Prof Professor Patsakis. I also work uh, right now in the security industry, and this is uh, a previous work of ours during my uh, stay at the Athena Research Center. Next. So, uh, as George stated before, this is a previous work that uh, finished a few months ago, practically on April 2022. Uh, it's mainly funded by two EU projects, CyberSec Europe and Locker. Um, this, uh, what we point out here is just uh, our personal views on these matters. I have nothing to do with either the Commission or any current uh, employers uh, of the people who were in the research. Next. So, uh, let's describe the main uh, motivation and more or less the idea of what we are doing here. So practically, as many of you might know, there was a famous uh, security incident that uh, was made from uh, someone who coined the, uh, the name uh, Phineas Fisher. Uh, practically what uh, he did, he, what he did is that um, he created uh, a zero day exploit for some service, for, for some service, scanned the internet in order to find which are let's say the available and um, vulnerable endpoints that uh, use uh, this service and try to penetrate them. Uh, during this course, he managed to penetrate uh, a web bank uh, from, Cayman, uh, from Cayman Islands and uh, hacking his way in, uh, he provided uh, all the details of what he did, how he did it. Uh, the very concept is that uh, practically we have the details from the attacker side, not from the analysis of uh, how a financial institution is actually uh, viewed in the eyes of the attacker. And nevertheless, this is uh, rather old. Uh, what we wanted to do is that uh, given the current uh, threat landscape, is to try to find ways to create this experiment in terms of new C2 uh, servers, in terms of new attacking uh, uh, methods. However, also to try to stress test the defensive mechanism that uh, current critical infrastructure, or current, uh, let's say, financial institution would use. Next. Uh, prior to continuing, it's worth noting that uh, in this case, we will try to, uh, instead of using an external facing asset like the Sonic Wall VPN that uh, Finesse Fisher used and exploit for, uh, we will uh, move to more realistic things as we will see later. And also uh, that in a malware testing lab, uh, it's not always uh, effective simulating uh, user uh, activity, which will give an attacker places to hide things to hijack and also uh, a false positive rate so which he can blend with so uh, this is something we can keep in mind that in a malware testing lab malware will always stand out and give the defenses some kind of advantage so so practically uh, as we said we were trying to recreate the environment uh, a so-called servwood that uh, Phineas uh, Fisher uh, actually detailed uh, in a more, let's say, recent environment. Here in the diagram, you can see more or less the network setup that we used. It's all recreated using VMs. 
practically, you can see that we have uh, a PF sense uh, in order to more or less provide some segmentation to the network. You can see that in the endpoints, we have used sentiment one and 40 ADR. Uh, the idea here is that we try to create a heterogeneous environment where different machines are protected with different security mechanisms so that uh, it's more difficult for one uh, for an attacker to uh, hop from one machine to the other. So um, the idea is that uh, we have uh, positioned a, a Citrix server in an restricted zone uh, to allow access only to the job server, uh, more or less to uh, recreate how things would be uh, in a bank's uh, secure zone. Uh, George? Uh, so, yes, uh, we use the Hyper-V server to host everything. Here you can see more or less the zones, the work zone, the secure zone, which contains the Citrix Zen app. And the jump server, we try to make uh, things look uh, as realistic as possible network wise. We would have to go from here to the jump zone to the Citrix server. And also, we use some things like Clam AV on uh, Squid uh, to filter basic network traffic, blah, blah. So it's just uh, we focus more on the endpoints to this extent. So uh, let me present to you the offensive capabilities we had. Uh, as uh, we, if you read the articles of Finesse Fisher, you will see that he was mainly using things like partial empire, meterpreter, things that are out there. So uh, modern uh, APTs and offenders in general uh, will use some kind of command and control means. Uh, things will not always. Uh, there are scenarios where you can use like already existing assets, but you will always need some kind of malware to ease your way in and do things. And so we chose five diverse yet uh, highly promising malware uh, that are used, but are not uh, that are private and proprietary and not out there for everyone. Uh, so we will start uh, by presenting Nighthawk. It's the work of MDSEC one of the top security firms at this moment. Uh, it's a hardcore red team toolkit for from hardcore red teamers for hardcore red teamers. Uh, stealth configurability and feature richness is in mind, but the main point that makes always Nighthawk stand out is basically there are two points. Private research that is applied uh, by the people at MDSEC and as features and also the malleability. This means that uh, this is a highly, uh, a, a malware that can use uh, highly diverse techniques to evade detection. You can always attribute a specific pattern to it because there are many ways in it to do uh, things. Uh, there are some techniques that are, some of them are being slowly published by uh, the team. Some are kept in private. You can spoof uh, things like ATW, TI uh, instrumentation, which take place in, takes place in NTOS kernel, which it's very hard to avoid. And spoofing strategies for mini filter callbacks, uh, which is also driver related technology AVs use, the, the basic driver technology AVs will use. They will have a mini filter with kernel callbacks to monitor uh, operating system events. So uh, some of the features that we actually used and uh, had the chance to test and do our work with uh, was the ROP-based system called unhooking uh, and later full DLL unhooking uh, stealth feature and other stealth features. It will make the operator's life easier by cleansing the process and uh, reducing uh, API-based um, uh, IOCs that will occur from tools you run because we need to separate IOCs that are related to the C2 and those that are related to the tools. If I run, uh, let's say, safety cards, this will have all the IOCs of loading mimic ads and also accessing ELSAs. 
regardless of my CPU, and this will get caught. So there are things that you will try to do. This applies to user mode uh, protections mostly. There is also thread stack spoofing, trying to evade uh, thread analysis and what the thread did. And in memory hiding uh, while sleeping, uh, trying to disguise in memory Nighthawk so that it will evade scanners. Uh, there are some customized process injection methods and some uh, process injection methods that you can use but are like uh, OPSEC uh, boosted, let's say in some cases, uh, so that as we will see later, we want to blend in uh, and also network and callback related uh, uh, features for undercover beaconing. You can use teams, you can use like custom templates. You can use many means of transfer. So we will now talk about Brutrat LC4. It was created by Dark Vortex and more specifically an experienced operator. Uh, it's a low cost alternative to Cobalt Strike and it's supposed to be lesser known, more effective and more stealthy. Uh, some of the features include customized reflective loaders, some buff files, beacon object files that will execute after some memory allocation that will execute in memory. Uh, LDAP Sentinel for enumeration, easily configurable TTPs through the malleable profiles of it and the settings. Uh, thing is, uh, this product was not the most stable we have seen. We had several issues with it. There, uh, the delivery methods were limited. So uh, when you load something dynamically, there are more chances of it to get caught, especially in the case of those specific two EDRs we had that have some uh, very uh, intriguing, let's say, methods to target shellcode itself. And uh, we tried to spoof that. In some cases, it worked. In some cases, it didn't. But uh, in, we will see that this C2, uh, this C2's function will be highly dependent on the environment and the endpoint. For example, if there is an in process client because we had things like uh, sometimes an infinite loop or we had like, uh, we tried to turn the solution into passive mode and see what gets caught and when and where. Uh, in general, we had some functionality issues, but uh, the main idea is that basic task can be um, performed. However, even though we got a foothold, the way in some cases, things were performed, it would trigger the ADRs on post-exploitation. And this is something we need to keep in mind that, okay, we've got a foothold. What do we do next? How do we do it? What is our context and how are we secure? Did we raise the score for some reason, et cetera. So uh, we need, unfortunately, uh, we didn't manage to complete the scenario with this one. And uh, we saw, we learned things uh, because we had diverse ways. We had like uh, many ways the ADRs would detect uh, for different things of this tool and uh, on, on access in some cases, or as I told you after some post-exploitation task. But we need to keep in mind that we need adaptability, a holistic approach towards OPSEC and kill chains and uh, stability. This is something an operator good enough, wouldn't be able to afford to lose in a real bank or raising the alarm, as we will see later, which could mess the operation. So uh, Cobalt Strike, the most well-known, uh, many, much work done from the community, many features. Now we, uh, the latest uh, version at the experiments time was 4.4. Now, Cobalt Strike, we have to say that they do some great work on pushing updates and also some things were changed in general in help system. So uh, we see a lot of potential to becoming again the top, but it's still the norm for uh, threat actors and red teamers out there. Uh, however, we wanted to break the norm by exploring alternatives. In this case, we have now user-defined reflective loaders, buffs, uh, reflective DLLs. Uh, we have various kits, which we didn't use to a great extent because as you will see later, the basically uh, 
on touch, on access, Cobalt Strike was killed by many traps of the ADRs, uh, either format-wise because of the shellcode, either behavior-wise. Uh, it was not something, it's something that the companies invested a lot into. Uh, and there are many ways to do this behaviorally, uh, from emulation, many things, uh, memory inspection. Uh, and we tried other EDRs apart from the two we uh, tested above. And we saw that if we didn't do much work on our own, or we didn't use some kind of state zero, or we didn't use some uh, very uh, specific configuration or loader specific uh, uh, methods and have a good OPSEC wise logic, uh, we would get caught by things, by uh, other EDRs as well that uh, are not so known, some of them. Uh, based on network stuff like uh, network inspection and uh, beaconing patterns, like um, many things uh, like uh, memory scanning, uh, behavior such as loading DLLs, etc. So uh, as you can see, uh, the, we can try to avoid some IOCs, but it's mostly up to the operator. And in this case, we will see a research from Sophos in 2021 and Cobol strike out of 405 tools observed. It, was, it represented the 7% uh, of it. So it's rather, uh, a rather interesting uh statistic this one so uh no this is not a blue screen uh in our case um those features of cobal strike like the kits etc were not very helpful but uh i already described uh what we wanted but uh, what i have to say is that cobal strike is also much uh let's say uh, configurable. And if you side, there was an interesting article out there showing that if you sideload Cobalt Strike into Teams and also make the network behavior look similar to Teams, uh, you could be able to evade some kind of inspection. So Cobalt Strike is a high quality product, but unfortunately at this time, uh, it wasn't what we wanted and what we needed. And, uh, and sometimes about the tools that are there, there are very skilled coders, very skilled redeemers, but in our case, uh, sometimes uh, tools out there are not developed full-time by a company. So this is something to keep in mind. So uh, Havoc was created by a personal friend of mine. It represents the other or unknown threats. And uh, in my opinion, uh, it's a very ambitious and very well-designed code-wise attempt. Uh, we had some generic issues because this uh, solution was created for the most of, of the ADRs and not our niche uh, thread landscape. Um, we managed, we helped Paul as a team. Uh, we assisted in the development process and we created some generic uh, EDR uh, and OPSEC safety related features. And we were able, although the communications were limited, now they're not because uh, new, uh, listen, new beaconing options were added, but at the time it was still at beta. Same went for Nighthawk. And uh, we tried as much as we could to uh, make this uh, solution adaptable. And we managed actually to use a solution that's like you see in the movies, a young person with a hoodie coding in the dark, etc. Uh, this, uh, this managed to work really well and we managed to complete although with some more effort and some more trial and error and uh, digging into the internals of stuff, uh, we managed to operate. And this is some of the very interesting points of this research. So Oyaban was a stage zero. What this means is that it will make uh, just some basic recon and execution tasks. There was like uh, NGROC integration, go native, reversal, 
it uses TCP dialer and uh, goes way to execute system commands, which was very helpful. Key logging and discovery features. It's not 100% stable always, but the because it's a new product as well, but the team uh, tries as much as possible. And the, we have had like uh, a significant amount of effort and growth in terms of product and product, I mean, as technology and improvement and learning uh, with the team. So it's a very interesting product. Uh, they try to make it more and more stable. They will change the code base soon, from what I know. Uh, thing is, it's just a static and staged binary. It may be limiting at some points. You can turn it into shell code if you like, with some kind of uh, recreation of bootstrap reflective loader, but uh, this will be unrelated at this moment. Uh, we managed due to this nature to do things. And uh, we will proceed to the next slide. Professor? Professor, we can't hear you. Sorry. The nice uh, casualties that we have from streaming and from online meetings. So uh, <clears throat> there are several differences uh, compared to, let's say, casual engagements. First, uh, we have to note that um, uh, we have two different solutions that are working rather differently. Um, so the case of unhooking is not always an option uh, in order to evade the, def uh, the defense mechanisms. So for example, Fortinet is based on memory patterns and kernel-based uh, filtering. So practically, unhooking is not that easy. And um, in the case of Sentinel-1, uh, it also has some uh, generic uh, mode, uh, sorry, Tops. hooking mechanism for uh, in the kernel. Nevertheless, it uh, also tries to find uh, low-hanging fruits in the case of uh, typical bypasses that uh, an adversary would uh, uh, would try to make, but uh, also let's say through the star uh, rules that it has, tries to find uh, many bypasses. Here uh, in the environment that we have recreated, uh, it is worth it to note that uh, one mistake is enough in order to showcase that. Uh, uh, an attack is being uh, uh, has been launched. The idea is that uh, currently, with uh, all these mechanisms, which are uh, monitoring uh, all these uh, system requests, uh, all these uh, system calls, uh, the network traffic, etc., uh, operating in an OPSEC uh, way is not that easy. Nevertheless, it's mandatory because it will immediately show that uh, the attacker is doing uh, something uh, malicious. Um, as, uh, as I noted uh, earlier, the environment that we have created is very diverse, meaning that uh, each host has a different endpoint security mechanism. So practically this means that uh, whatever works in host A doesn't necessarily mean that um, we work on host B. So practically, this means that um, in every hope that you make inside the, in the network, you need more. Uh, you need to be more uh, cautious because uh, you need different tools and different methods. Uh, something that uh, was not pointed out is that, uh, as we said, the the uh, experiments finished on April. Nevertheless, they took uh, several months in order to uh, to be made. And uh, the main reason is that uh, uh, we had uh, we engagement with uh, several of these vendors uh, in order to report issues, in order to report bugs, 
so that uh, they will be patched uh, and not make uh, more or less uh, a red uh, or not a red dimmer, but uh, an APT 101. Yeah, that, exactly. <laughs> uh, more or less a guideline of what to do when you are uh, uh, facing a financial institution and how to penetrate it. No, that was not the case. So we responsibly disclosed issues that we found uh, so that uh, uh, the whole ecosystem is uh, secure. Uh, it's uh, worth noting that the traps of both solutions are quite innovative because in the case of Sentinel-1, there is a trap to cover a trap to cover a trap, and we had the chance to beta test many of those traps in during this scenario uh, before they were ready for production. And also in the case of 40DR, uh, we were uh, we had the chance to also check stuff and see how the real-time memory structure inspection works and it's not like casual scanning it's how uh, shell code for example would be different than a valid pe and uh, if there would be like uh, not normal uh, normal behaviors so um, from how they look in memory from those there's a different of how things will look in memory and this is harder to avoid so some of the basic ttps are uh, some excel files uh, the other files with a specific uh, icon which is very tempting to click and a specific export that will launch specific code customized injections like uh, dll hollowing which will patch the address of entry point with some kind of shell code or we will try to uh like um uh blend uh, several injection techniques or opsec safety techniques like uh where we inject and what we inject and how do we do this msi files are well known installer files we can add actions that will include persistence like adding registry keys uh services blah blah whatever this could mean execute commands, run our binaries, uh, use it for DLL side loading, which we will mention later, whether it's a loader or a, a static binary, it's a good way to blend in with an application. So privileged driver-based loading and vulnerable drive abuse, we try to abuse other exploitable drivers that may expose, for example, an IOCTL that we can take advantage of and do our uh, execute our code through this driver or uh, impair the defenses. An example are anti rootkit tools, which you can use, for example, to load a driver, uh, do whatever you want to some extent uh, in the system from the kernel level, disable the AV, uh, maybe some shadowing, uh, as there are in internet cafes. You can use such tools to evade shadowing and see the coin miners the employees have planted on the PCs. <laughs> this is how I get my free coffee when I go to the internet cafe. Uh, <laughs> so I, I never uh, told anything about this. Snitches get stitches. <laughs> but in any case, uh, we try to use customized vendor specific spoofing and bug abuse techniques that we would things we would do from the architecture of the solution itself to turn it around and make the EDR hit itself. So credential theft, we could use drivers again, like WinPMM to dump the physical memory and parse it and get credentials, reflective loading and loading of tools, including CLR and PS, uh, partial tools and reflection are things that we try to see how they would behave uh, in such a scenario, where we load the CLR, what's the process? If it's Excel through an XLL, for example, it's easier because uh, Excel will be will make network connection, which is which is better for coverage, and also uh, it has the CLR loaded by default. So this is a quick meter mapping, Professor. Yes. So practically, we try to map here what we consider. Uh, we, that uh, has already been made by the attacker in green. And more or less in red, we highlight 
what are the capabilities that uh, we have developed uh, in terms of resource development, initial access, execution, uh, etc. I, I hope that this is readable because it's far too many things that are listed here. Okay. So okay. Yes, uh, I will proceed. So this is the offensive scenario review. You can see some of the screenshots and proof of concepts. This is Sentinel One's timelines, uh, which are pretty cool, I guess. Same goes for Fortinet uh, for NZIX. They give you queries, and you can attribute things to an actor. But in depth, like what did you find? What kind of attack did you find? How? If you find this kind of IOC, notify me about this. So here we can see uh, a casual process injection with a new thread creation. Uh, we can see execution of tools through Nighthawk. We can see how the panel worked and uh, how we managed to do some credential theft through keylogging and credential theft techniques in general, uh, how we execute tools and how we disabled the ADR. So here, uh, CLR beacons, for example, were loaded in processes that indeed use such technology. This is a good, we need to take into account OPSEC. So if I want to beacon through WinHTTP, uh, I will use a browser, for example, to eject into because it would be abnormal loading this, uh, uh, this tool, for example. This DLL inside another, uh, whatever process. So we need to be careful how we look both on the endpoint and on the network. Uh, there's diverse tooling. We use diverse tools to achieve the same things. We try to uh, use the kernel as much as possible and do things like impairing the defenses so we could then launch, launch Cobalt Strike or use a driver to uh, and exploit also a Navy solution to through a privileged scenario to inject into processes uh, into the installing like a free AV from the internet, whatever you will find many, and injecting into that protected process and try to avoid some of the traps this way of uh, and some of the monitoring by other tools. And the anti-incident response is like uh, things like uh, in-memory masking of uh, uh, the Nighthawk presence and things, you will see that you will not always be able to find it through tools like Moneta PC or even some commercial tools. Uh, so this is the attack timeline. We got initial access very quickly uh, from via mail from a categorized domain we had. Uh, we tried to use MSI exec combined with run DLL32. We used Excel, we used side loading into WhatsApp and injecting into that free AV. Uh, we also then dropped uh, a shortcut which would trigger an authentication to our farmer web dev server to steal credentials. Then we would impersonate the user, do GPO abuse, uh, use tools like standing, then make our user an admin, try do all these sorts of Active Directory casual things, casual exploitation things. So then we try to laterally move through uh, SOX proxies. Uh, uh, and we tried to execute the payload from a share or like launching the payload in some way. Uh, we uh, extract credentials with the WIMP MM, as I told you before. We used casual things like SARP exec, WMI, or WinRM to move through boxes. Uh, we tried internal monologue without the registry modifications for NTLM downgrade. This comes to the things we need to do when we want to avoid some certain footprint. And we want to control the actual uh, footprint uh, of our attacks and tools. So again, we tried to jump uh, on the final uh, Server, we used the now fixed vendor specific bug, which would blind the specific context of processes for uh, the solution. We didn't have to face to FA. However, there are recent articles and older articles, even in Finesse Fisher, you can see that you can steal the authentication tokens and bypass this. And there are also tools you could use for something like phishing for that, like Modliska. It's not something that's undoable, but 2FA uh, is always a good option to have. 
uh, this control is out of scope. So what's next, Professor? So practically, we have uh, contacted both Sentinel-1 and Fortinet uh, teams in order to uh, notify them of, uh, let's say, the important issues that we have found in the resolution. Uh, whether this has to do with architectural misses, whether this has to do with bugs or issues that were, we found, um, misses in the detection, uh, or let's say, gaps in the storyline that they created. Uh, practically, uh, both teams uh, have been quite responsive in patching their systems and providing uh, uh, patches to their customers so that uh, they are more secure. So uh, in few days, I believe that uh, if not already, uh, because uh, we are currently discussing with Sentinel-1 uh, in terms of uh, providing uh, a documentation of uh, these uh, experiments online, uh, there will be a, 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 an co article, article on the room. Yeah, exactly. A co authored article uh, from me and George uh, regarding uh, this experiment and will be hosted on their blog. Um, there is also the possibility of finding a, a similar article from Fortinet. Uh, however, we are waiting for the response from the marketing team. So a big thanks to all the team from MDSEC, uh, to Dominic, Peter, uh, Modexby, and Matthew. George? And of course, my friends, Paul Ungur, he has a great future ahead and the Red Code Labs team. Thank you for your uh, patience. These are our contact details and uh, we hope to hear from you soon. Uh, have a nice day.